king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good you're good oh you are Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins.
the things you've done before in greater measure you do again there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can move all things are possible and there's no
What is up, Brick Church? Welcome to Live at Five, man. We are so excited you are here today. Right now is the perfect opportunity to invite someone to join you. So you could tag them in the comments below. You could share a link. Man, you gather everybody around the screen so that we can have this beautiful moment today where we get to worship together as one family. Here at the Brick Church, we have what we call core values. Maybe you're new with us, you know what that is. You see, for us, core values are statements that drive who we are as a church. And one of my favorite core values is that we are spiritual contributors, not spiritual consumers. The church doesn't exist for us, but we are the church and we exist for the world. And what that can look like is a lot of different ways. But one of my favorite ways that we do that is what we would call invite culture. You see here at The Brick, it's a really big deal that we invite people. We think if you could just get people to the church inside of this space, they can find people that love them, a place they can connect to. And ultimately it's an opportunity that God could use to change somebody's life. And so for maybe you online, you're like, well, how could I be a part of that? Sharing live at five is a beautiful way to do that. Inviting friends, tagging people, posting it when it goes live, you inviting people to this space is one of the best ways you can be a spiritual contributor because now we have the opportunity to have a conversation about hope and who Jesus is with the entire world. And so my challenge to you today, if you're wondering how you could be a part of that core value, my challenge would be invite like crazy. You could tag them in now or next week, you could build a whole time around inviting people like crazy. They could come and be a part of what is happening here at The Brick on Live at Five. Now's the time in our experience where we receive our tithes and offerings. And what I wanna do is help you see how special your generosity truly is. Because not only are you helping us create this moment, this conversation that we get to have today about Jesus and this beautiful place we get to come to worship to, but there are a ton of other things the church gets to do that's happening because of your generosity. As a student pastor, we got to have a really cool event this last Wednesday called Fiesta Night. And we got to see 70 kids come in and we watched them connect and they got to eat tacos and we had these really cool drinks. But the most beautiful part about it was because of your generosity, we were able to give that to them. We have to charge the kids for that, but there was a space they could come and they could just belong. And we got to watch at the end of the night, students give their lives to Jesus. They got to be a part of these small groups that we call tribes, where they got to connect with each other and get to find that there are people in this world that love and believe in them. And that over and over and over and over again happens because of your generosity, whether it's Live Kids, whether it's Switch, whether it's various nonprofits the church gets to give to, or it's something like Live at Five. Your generosity is quite literally changing lives every single week. And so as a church, we wanna say thank you. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here at The Brick. And if you're ready to give, we've got a real simple way you could do that. There's a phone number that's on the screen and you can text that phone number. What's gonna happen is it's gonna link you up to a credit card, debit card, or bank account. But however you give, we wanna say thank you so much. It matters and it is absolutely changing lives. But now, what we're about to do is we're gonna dive into our third and final week of Voices in the Storm from our lead pastor, Jerry Callahan. Let's check it out. Today we're finishing uh, Voices in the Storm, um, and so far what we've talked about is Elijah and Elijah trying to get close to hear the voice of God, that it's a still, small voice, and what does it look like kind of when you're on the run and when you're, you're in a frantic mode to hear the voice of God? What does it look like to... to Get yourself in a position to hear the voice of God. And we've talked about Peter, when God draws us to take a faith step, like a big, bold faith step to get out of the boat and listen to the voice of God above our fear, above our worries. And today, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, what do you, how do you hear the voice of God when it feels like he's silent? How do you hear the voice of God when it feels like he's not talking at all? How do you hear the voice of God when it feels like God is asleep? Like, no, no, I'm, 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 especially if you feel like you're doing all that God's called you to do. Like you're, you're trying to live out the, the call of God in your life. You feel like you've asked all the right questions. You feel like you're going the direction God has for you. And it feels like he's asleep. He's just not answering. You keep saying like, God, wake, wake up, answer my question. It feels like maybe he's not asleep, but it does feel like that at times. It does feel like you're doing all that you're called to do. And it's like, where God are you in this moment? I feel like I've done everything I know to do at this point, And I don't hear your voice. So we're going to look at a story where Jesus is actually asleep in the middle of a storm. And we're going to walk through 
um, how they woke him up and how we wake Jesus up. What does it look like to wake Jesus up and hear the voice of God? And so in this story, in this moment, uh, the disciples have been on one side of the Sea of Galilee and they've been teaching all day long or Jesus has been teaching all day long, crowds, multitudes of people. um, And it was time for for them to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee because Jesus is gonna tell them it's time to go to the other side, right? So he's been teaching all day. The, The context of the story seems to suggest that he's exhausted. That he's really tired. He's worn out. I don't know if you've ever had that day where you just like poured out all that you can pour out. Like you've given all that you can give and then you just drive home in silence. Have you ever had that one? Where you're just like, I don't know radio. Don't need anything on the radio. I just need, just be quiet. Just, you sit in your driveway a couple minutes extra. Like just, I'm just going to sit here because it feels like you're just so drained. I think that's where Jesus was, just done. He poured out all he could pour out, and it's time to go to the other side. And, and the start of the journey is this in Mark chapter 4, verse 36. It says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him, talking about Jesus, along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him, Right? So they just took him like he was. There's some, based on the rest of the story that Jesus is going to end up falling asleep in the middle of a storm, based on the rest of the story in the context of this phrase, they took him as he was. I think Jesus was tired. Jesus was like, I'm spent. We're going to the other side. Just get me in the boat. Let's go. Right? And then all of the crowds of the people that they've been teaching to, now whatever boats that they have access to, they start to follow. They start to come alongside Jesus because they want more from him when he doesn't have anything left to give. He's tired. He's exhausted. He's going along as he is. And sometimes the storm... As frustrating as it may be, as sometimes the storm is actually going to help you decide who is in your boat and who should be in your boat. Sometimes there are a lot of people that are, that are in the little boats, that are on the sidelines of your life. They, they want to be the, the sideline coaches or the, the armchair quarterbacks, right? They're the ones on the side that want to tell you how to live and what you should do. And sometimes you have some people that when you get into the storm, it's going to help you decide Who's supposed to be there with you? It's going to weed out the people that are supposed to be in your boat and the people that aren't supposed to get to the other side with you. Okay? So what I don't mean is that they're going to be dead. Hopefully not. Hopefully they're still alive and they're thriving in whatever God's called them to be. But just because they're thriving and where God's called them to be is not the same as they're supposed to be in your boat doing what you're doing, getting to the other side of where you're called to be. There are just people that for a season... You're in the right spot. They're helping you. You're growing together. You're going places. And then you find out, the storm hits, and you find out they're not supposed to be there with me. They're, they're, not, they're not designed on the journey that I'm in. They're not in the boat that I'm in. They're not following Jesus the way that I'm following Jesus. They're not designed to be on the other side of the boat with me, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee with me. And that's okay, right? You can be okay loving people well and realizing they're not in your inner circle. Jesus had an inner circle. He had 12 disciples that he called out. They're supposed to be in the boat. They're the only ones in the boat in this story. He had an inner three inside of that 12 that got an intimate knowledge of different things that were taking place that the other 12 get. It's okay to recognize that sometimes in life, the storm's gonna hit and it's gonna weed out who is just the little boats that are following and who's supposed to stay in the boat and be with you and be connected, all right? Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to go through your list on your phone and look through all the people who haven't texted you in six months and decide they're out. Like you just have this litmus test. Like you ain't checked on me that I was going through something and you didn't ask. Like the Holy Spirit should have told you if you're in my boat that I was going through something hard. That's, people are going through stuff. Not everybody's going to text you all the time. And the last I checked, I don't, they may have changed this because I'm, I'm old and technology is changing all the times. But the, the last I checked, phones work both ways. The last I checked, and sometimes we hold this litmus test to expect more out of them than we give in the relationship. We expect them to always reach out to us and always be there for us. We expect them to pour into us, and sometimes it needs to be a mutually beneficial relationship where if we're going to be in this boat together, we're going to make each other better. It's going to be iron sharpening iron, like Scripture says. So I don't want you to have some like petty litmus test on how you decide who's in your boat. But what I do want you to recognize is when the storm hits, when, start, when stuff starts to happen, when, it, when it's all going down, who are your top five? Who's on your speed dial? I know that's not a thing anymore. Speed dial. Your top five. Mobile top five. You don't even have to have it. Who's in your favorite list on your iPhone? Who's in your favorites list that you know you need to call when it's all going down? Who are the people that are going the direction that you would like to be or are going in the direction the same way where you want to go? Those are the people you start to assess. Oh, no, no. I need to be intentional about making sure they're in my boat. They're following Jesus like I'm following Jesus. They're going a direction that I would like to end up. They are the people that I need to reach out to and maybe be intentional about. Hey, like, let's go grab some lunch. 
I need, I need to reach out. I need to hang out with you. Let's grab some coffee. Let's talk. I need to be able to pour into your life, and I need you to pour into my life. So, so one of the side benefits to the storm, even though I don't think God creates the storms in our life in, very, in almost every instance, I don't think God creates the storms. Life will bring its own storms. But the side benefit is that it will help you weed out who's supposed to be in your boat. Who is supposed to be there with you? Because the wrong people in your boat will take you the wrong direction. If they're not supposed to be on the other side, they're not going to be there, and you're not going to be there with them when you're supposed to be in a different direction. So who's supposed to be in your boat is, the, is maybe a side question that I want you to ask today. If I'm going to wake Jesus up, I'm going to get to the other side of where Jesus called me to be, maybe there are some relationships, some friendships, some people that I love, and I'm going to keep loving. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to let them in inner circle anymore. They don't get to influence the direction of my life. They don't get to tell me what to do. They don't speak godly wisdom into my life. So I'm going to be very careful about how and when I listen to them. I'm going to create context where they get an opportunity to step up and step into what God's called them to be or to step out into wherever they want to go. And I might just set that up and decide, like, no, 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 we're going to hang out at church, but not anywhere else. You want to start living a godly life? Then come to church with me, and then we'll go grab lunch. Otherwise, I'm not going out with you on Friday night. Saturday night's not our time to jam because we don't, we don't do well together. We make bad choices together, and that's not on you. That's on me, too. But I got to decide who's in my boat. And so then they're in the boat, weeds out the boats because the storm's coming. And here's what happens with the storm in Mark chapter 4, verses 37 and 38. It says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he, talking about Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I want to set a picture of what this looks like. Uh, just to be clear, and we've talked about this a couple weeks, uh, but just to be clear, three of the, of the 12 disciples, at least three, were fishermen. And so had intimate knowledge of what it looks like to be in a boat. They had intimate knowledge of what it looked like to be in a storm. They had intimate knowledge. They were raised with a family of fishermen. So they knew if they were scared, they had reason to be scared. The boat was filling with water, it said. It was, already, it was filling with water. They had reason to be afraid. If they didn't have reason to be afraid, three of them would have been like, hey, hey, guys, let's let Jesus sleep. He's had a long day, man. That Jesus, you see how long he taught for? That was amazing. Did you see the miracles he did? Let that man sleep. Let's chill. But they didn't. They were a part of the group waking them up. So you know it's a serious storm. And then in the middle of that storm, Jesus is snoozing. Now, the way that I've always pictured this story is that Jesus is like under the deck. Like they got this nice little yacht where he's just like under a deck somewhere and he just feels the nice cozy rock. He doesn't know it's filling. He's not feeling the rain. He's just like rocked asleep like a baby. Let me give you a picture of what a first century Sea of Galilee boat might have looked like. This is, the, this is a mock-up of what everything we've discovered in the Sea of Galilee. This is a, the best mock-up we have of the average fishing boat. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but there's no underbelly to go sleep in. The back of the boat, uh, there on the back on my right, the back of the boat would have been where he was sleeping. So he was getting rained on unless he had a canvas on, but he's still filling the water, filling everything. He's so exhausted that in the back of the boat on a pillow, filling the rain, filling the water fill up, he's still asleep. That's some next level sleep, right? Some of you have spouses who sleep like that during storms and it frustrates you like crazy. Anybody? Anybody? No, it's just, it's just my wife. It's just my wife that's mad because I'm snoozing. I'm like, I don't, if we're meant to die, we're meant to die because I'm asleep. She'll wake me up. Hey, is it bad? I don't know. I'm asleep just like you. I don't know if it's bad. I don't know if we need to get in the shelter. Talk to Travis Meyer because I'm going back to sleep. So it's like frustrating, right? It's like, it's, it's frustrating because that person sleeps really well and you're terrified for your life. You're terrified for your life. And they ask Jesus the question, like, do you not even care? That's the same question my wife asked me. Do you not even care? Like, uh, not in this moment. I'm tired. And Jesus does, Jesus is better than me, obviously. And they're like, do you not even care? So there, there's this moment where it feels like the ship's going down. It feels like life is sinking. There's this moment that you may empathize and understand where in your life, you feel like you're exactly where God called you to be, right? For, for these disciples, they know they're in the boat with Jesus. Like they don't have to second guess it. They know that they, he told them to go to the other side. And yet in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the worst part of it, feels like they're drowning, feels like they're going down. It feels like everything's going wrong. In the middle of doing exactly what Jesus called them to do, they look over and Jesus is asleep. He's snoozing. He's, he's passed out. He's asleep. And I would, I would bet that for many of us, sometimes life feels like that. Like, I'm, do- I'm doing all that God's called me to do, and it feels like he's asleep. Is he asleep? 
Like, is, is Jesus actually asleep in heaven? Does he, does he go up there and he snoozes and you just, you like have to really pray hard to wake him up? Is it really a litmus test to where Jesus is waiting on you to pray hard enough, pray loud enough to wake him up and get his attention? There are actually some parables in the New Testament that sound very similar to maybe Jesus is asleep. There's uh, one found in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, there's a story and Jesus is teaching on how to pray. He's telling like, hey, this is how you're going to pray. When you pray, it's kind of like this. And then he tells a story. And in this story, he's like, this is how you have to pray. Imagine that you have a friend show up in the middle of the night that's hungry and you don't have enough food for him. They're your friend. You go to your next door neighbor and you knock on the door and they're like, hey, God, we've, already, we've already locked. We don't have no food for you. Uh, it's, it's nighttime. We're all in bed. Like, go away. And Jesus says, your friend's not going to answer you because they've already locked the doors. They've already done all their nighttime routines. They're in bed. They're not going to answer you. But if you keep knocking, you keep knocking, they're going to answer you. Then keep knocking some more until eventually your friend is going to answer you and give you the bread that you need to feed the stranger that showed up, to feed the friend that showed up. You keep knocking. The parable that Jesus says about prayer sounds like God might be up there just like, no, nah, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Mm-mm. What'd you want? You wanted a, you wanted a car that ran? No, nah, not today. Not today. You're going to have to ride ride a bicycle. Like you're praying like, God, please show up. Heal my family. I don't know. I'm going to try to train you in some things. I'm going to let them be sick. I'm just going to let them just because I'm I'm tired. I've already done my nighttime routine. I'm asleep. That's that's the, the portrayal that Jesus sounds like he's saying about God. In Luke 18, he doubles down. There's this another story saying this is how you pray. And when you pray, you're going to be like this widow who goes to a judge. And when, when this widow goes to the judge... Uh, the judge is, is an ungodly man and doesn't want to answer the widow. He says eventually, because the widow keeps persisting, and the widow keeps bugging this judge who doesn't care, eventually she'll do it, not because he's just, but because she annoyed him enough. And that's how you pray. Oh, that's who, who God is. God is just up there until you annoy him enough, he will not answer you. Like he's just going to be up there waiting. And at the end of that parable in Luke chapter 18, verse 7, he says this, It will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? It sounds like it. It actually sounds like it. That's supposed to be a redundant question, Jesus. But it sounds like based on the stories that you're telling about how I'm supposed to pray, it sounds like he does go to sleep. It sounds like Jesus does just wait on me to, to ask long enough, to pray hard enough, to wait to me to get to an emotional state that's fervent enough for God to answer. It sounds like God is like always in this test mode where he's trying to frustrate me to the point to where it's at the very last minute he's going to show up. It actually sounds like you keep putting them off. But then in Luke 11 and at the end of these verses, Jesus says, but your heavenly father knows how to give good gifts. Your heavenly father, like if you know how to give good gifts, he knows how to give better gifts. If you know that your son needs a piece of bread, not a rock, then how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts? And when I'm reading those, when I'm thinking through those, I'm like, these are conflicting narratives. Right? These are conflicting narratives of who God is and if God is sleeping or if God is awake, if he's listening to me or if he's ignoring me, is God trying to hold off? It sounds like in one, out of one side of your mouth, you're telling me that, that he's loving and he's kind and he's trying to bestow good gifts on me. He's looking for opportunities to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing I can't contain. It sounds like you're saying that, but then also saying like, but, but, but you have to keep asking. Like you have to beg. You got to get on your knees. You got, you got to really, you got to pray hard enough to, for the voice of God to hear you. Doesn't that sound conflicting? It sounds like two different gods. Is he conflicted up there? Is Jesus and God arguing with each other? And they're like, having, no, answer him. And God's like, not yet. No, 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 for real, answer him. Are they bickering with each other? What is going on in heaven that it seems like he's asleep, but it's also telling us he's not? It seems like he, do, he takes forever to answer, but it says that he wants to answer us immediately. There's a conflict. And here's what I need you to know. Your heavenly father absolutely without a shadow of doubt loves you and is looking for an opportunity to give you good gifts. That's the truth and the faith that I have in God. That he, he is looking for opportunities to bless you. In Psalms, it says he's, he's chasing you down. He's pursuing you with his goodness and his mercy. He is looking and hunting you to chase you down so he can catch up and give you that good gift. Like if you, like if you, you had that wrong order, you got the wrong order at the restaurant and they had to run after your car to give you your order. That's how God, how good God is. He's chasing you down to try to get the thing that you missed, to try to give you the good gifts. He's chasing you down, trying to bless you. That's the heart of our father. So what is going on? What is going on behind the scenes that we say, well, we know he's not asleep. He doesn't need sleep in heaven. What is going on? The only picture I have that that gives me a glimpse and what is taking place 
the, the, this glimpse shows up in uh, Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, it tells me this moment where a guy named Daniel, a prophet named Daniel, prays. And when that prophet prays, he prays the first day, nothing happens. He starts fasting. He's fasting. He's fasting. In Daniel 10, he keeps fasting. And he's not, he's not eating any nice foods. He's not eating any of these other things. He's fasting. He's suffering in his body to get the answer that he wants from God. He's suffering in order to pursue, pursue God closer. He's fasting. He fasts on the 21st day. In Daniel 10, it says that an angel shows up and gives him the answer he needs. And then he explains himself. In Daniel 10, it says that the angel tells him, on the very first day you, you, you cried out, the very first day you prayed, I was sent. The very first time you asked your heavenly father, he was looking for an opportunity to get it to you, is what that, what, how I hear that. But he says, the prince of Persia withheld me. The prince of Persia withheld me. There is a spiritual force that slowed me down to stop me to get the answer that I wanted to get to you. There is a spiritual force that was slowing me down to get the answer that God sent on the first day. There is potentially, and this may be heretical to some of you, a limitation on God based on free will of the whole heavens, the free will of all of hell, and the free will of the people in your life. There are limitations that God has set himself up with that he wants to get you something and yet has a limitation to get you that. There's limitations that scripture acknowledges. He says that he wants everybody to be saved, but we also recognize not everybody is saved. So there's obviously something going on behind the scenes. And here's what I think the New Testament is trying to get to you. That your God is not asleep. Even though it feels like Jesus is asleep in your boat, he's not asleep. He's wide awake and he's listening and he's hearing and he's right there with you. He's in the boat. He believes in you. He wants more for you. He's got something for you. However, the way that you pray is as though he is asleep. The way that you seek him, the way that you knock on the door to get your answer, the way that you pursue God is as though he is asleep. It's not a conflict until you see, once you see behind the scenes and recognize maybe there are limitations on God getting his answer to me. And maybe, just maybe, he's saying, I need you to knock like this, not because your heavenly father doesn't want to give it, not because he's not a good God who loves you, and he's not because he's asleep. I need you to knock like this. I need you to ask like the widow asked and keep persisting because your prayers are an effective tool in the fight against the enemy. Maybe it has nothing to do with the heart of your father, that it's actually his heart is always to give you good things, but it is your prayer life and your spiritual practices that get you to a place to where you are starting to fight in the spiritual world in order to get the answer to break through. In order to get the, the healing broke through, to order to get the deliverance broke through, the financial breakthrough you're looking for, maybe it is your prayer life and your persistence and your knocking that is a powerful tool that God is wielding to get his answer to you. Maybe your prayers are effective. And maybe when you wake Jesus up, it feels like he's asleep. But it's not that he's asleep. It's that he's wide awake right there with you and saying, I'm fighting with you. I need you to fight too. I need you to keep praying. I need you to keep asking. Most often, just like Elijah, as we're praying, as we're seeking, it was not that we, and sometimes there is some spiritual resistance like Daniel, but more often than not, it's not really that there was a spiritual resistance stopping your answer. It's not really that a demon was stopping you from getting what God had called you to have. Most often, I think that's the case sometimes, but most often what is taking place is you aren't close enough to hear the whisper that Elijah heard. Most often, Jesus is sitting at the back of your boat saying, if you'll get, if you'll get over here, if you'll be able to hear me, if you will shut out the wind and the waves and the storm, I'm wide awake, but I'm not going to raise my voice at you. I need you to draw close to me because we're in a relationship. We're supposed to be tight. We're supposed to be close. You're supposed to be following me, not being afraid of the storm. So most often the spiritual practice that we have more than just fighting against things that are resisting your call, it is drawing you closer to hear the answer. And what God does in this moment is he gets up and Jesus says, be still. In one moment, in one moment, the answer that they needed is right there. One moment, the answer that they needed in God's voice, God's word, God's spoken word in that very moment solves every problem that they had. And for many of us, it's just getting close enough. It's fighting. There are resistance that you're fighting against, and sometimes that's the place, but more often than not, I've found that it's me getting to hear the voice of God speak and go, that's what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to know. That was the thing I was missing. That's what I need to adjust in my marriage. That's what I need to adjust in my finances. That's what I need to adjust about my job. That's what I need to calm the storm. Most of the time, it's me drawing close to him and realizing he was never asleep. It was me who moved away. It was me who let the storm get in the way. So there's some spiritual practices that help us get there, but also they do both things. 
Spiritual practices are, are, are spiritually powerful in, in the spirit world to fight against all the things that are resisting your answer, but they're also powerful in clearing your mind to hear him. And for some of us, we need to incorporate prayer as though we're the widow begging God. We need to incorporate prayer as though we're the friend knocking on the door over and over again. Scripture says to pray without ceasing. We need to incorporate that mentality in our prayer life. We need to maybe incorporate fasting. You may have to find out that you sacrificing something puts you in a place and a headspace to hear the voice of God in a way that you never have before. You might need to in- incorporate worship more into your daily life instead of just on a Sunday. You might need to make sure that you're reading more scripture and getting deeper into God's word. And maybe, maybe it's not just those spiritual practices. Maybe you've overlooked some very simple practices. Some of you need a Sabbath day. You just need a day of rest. You need a vacation from your job. Moms, Maybe the best gift you could ever have is a night away from everybody because you can't hear the voice of God because your toddler will not stop talking. They're all like that. I don't know what it is. You pray, for them to, you pray for them to start talking and then you pray for them to stop. It's just how it works. And maybe you just need a moment of silence. Maybe you need to go for a long drive. There's some simple things that you can do, but whatever you do, I'm challenging you today to believe and to see that your God loves you and he's trying to get your answer to you. So do all the work, all the knocking, all the pounding on the door, all the begging, all the pleading to get yourself in the right space to hear the voice of God and to fight in the spiritual world to get your answer back to you. Do all the things that you can do within your power and trust God for the rest. Do everything that you have the power to do. And the the next thing I would challenge you to do is today make a commitment that you're not gonna wait till the storm hits to seek the voice of God. That's the most common thing I've ever seen. That's the most common thing, especially in the American church. I can't speak around the world, but, but in, in our context, the most common thing that takes place is not the storm. It's not the issue of the storm. It's not the issue of the waves. Most often we find ourselves in a position where we didn't seek the voice of God before we got in the boat. So we're not even sure if we're supposed to be in the storm. So we turn the boat around. We don't even go, we don't even keep going the direction because we didn't even ask if we're in the right boat. We didn't ask if we were around the right people. We didn't ask the questions and seek the voice of God before we ever started the journey. And look, I'm, I'm about asking God all the questions. Pray without ceasing, I'm down for it. Ask him about what shoes you should wear that day. Ask him about what underwear you should wear that day. I don't care, he's, he's there, he loves you, he's got your best in mind. You can ask him all the questions. But especially, especially make sure you hear God's voice when you're about to make a big decision that's going to affect the rest of your life and your kid's life and your spouse's life. Make sure that you're doing, like, it astounds me that God has said he sent another comforter. It astounds me that he said he sent a comforter to, to be with you, to guide you, to direct you, and we just go about life flippantly like he's not there right alongside of us. We go about life like, well, I'm just dating this person because I met him, somebody introduced me, and I mean, I don't know if I'm supposed to be with him. And then you end up married. You end up married to people you hadn't prayed about. You haven't sought counsel with. It's like, what are, we, what are we doing? This is the most consequential relationship that you have in your life. It should be the most prayerful thing you have. It's like, what relationship should I be in? And we start to think about, like, when are we going to have kids? When are we not going to have kids? We start to think about jobs, and we just flippantly let the river take us wherever it wants to rather than asking God, am I supposed to be here? Is this who I'm supposed to be with? Because I want to know when the storm hits, because the storm will hit. I want to know I'm going the right direction. Because many times I think we turn ship in our marriage. We turn right back around in our marriage. We, we, we see the storm because the marriage got difficult and we're ready to jump ship and go see that divorce lawyer because we weren't sure that that's who God had for us. It's easy to turn around. We're not sure where, I, where, where, where we're at. But for me, I don't care how rocky the marriage gets. I look back and go, I prayed, I prayed for this one. I prayed for her. I believed for her. I asked God about her. So no matter how frustrating she is, I'm like, God, you put me in this storm. Right? And, like, and most of the time he's like, no, that's you. You created this storm. Like, you need to be nicer, right? So it, it doesn't matter. Like I prayed for these kids. I prayed for the moment to have them. I, I prayed so when my son's getting on my nerves because it's a mirror, he acts just like me and I want to punch me all the time. When he's getting on my nerves, I know this storm is where God's called me to be and I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to punch him. I'm going to love him. And I know that I'm where I'm called to be because we spent time asking and seeking. So I would challenge you before you get in the storm, before you make decisions about your job, before you make decisions about what city you're going to live in, before you make decisions about, uh, about college, like, am I going to go into $100,000 in debt for the school? I don't know. I, I would definitely talk to God about that. I would definitely have a conversation and get the voice of God of whether or not I'm supposed to go into this kind of debt for this degree. I would really seek some wise counsel. Check the people in your boat and say, hey, is this stupid? Because that's a lot of money that I'm about to spend. Is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? Maybe we should seek before the storm ever hits. Maybe we should hear his voice so that when the storm hits, all our job is to is to wake him up. 
All our job is to be like, hey, can you chill this out? Can you help me with this mortgage? Because I believe that you call me to be in this house. Can you help me with what's going on with my job? Because I believe you call me to be at this job. Can you help me with my marriage, with my kids, with my finances? God, because I believe I've been faithful and you call me to be here. My job is not to question whether I should turn the ship around. My job is just to seek the voice of God. So all this work, all this work of getting in the boat, making sure it's the right people, seeking the voice of God, knocking, constantly knocking, hearing the voice, all this work, is it worth it? Right? Is it worth it? to go through all that, all the mess, like, cause, cause there are times where I'm like, what if I just stayed on this side of the sea of Galilee and I just make it to heaven? Like, I don't want to do all that work. That's hard. Like seeking, questioning, asking, getting the right people in the boat. People sometimes get on my nerves. Even the right people sometimes get on my nerves. I don't know if I want all these people in my boat. Maybe I just want me in the boat and I'll just make it to heaven. Is it really worth it to do all this? And I would say yes, because there's something on the other side that's worth it. In Mark chapter four, They're going on the other side. And when they show up, it turns to Mark chapter 5. And what they get to on the other side is a man who is tormented. A man who, uh, Scripture says, is filled with demons. That's a whole other sermon about what that means, what that looks like. It says he's so uh, filled with demons that they couldn't even put chains around him because he had the capacity to break the chains off of him. That's how tormented he was. That he's living amongst the tombs and in the mountains. That that he's so struggling and nobody can go near him and he's by himself. And here's what it says about that man on the other side in Mark chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. It says, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Maybe the storm isn't worth it for just you. But maybe there's someone on the other side of where Jesus has called you to go and be. The other side of waking Jesus up. The other side of getting his attention. The other side of hearing the voice. The other side of him calming the storm in your life. Maybe there's somebody who's looking for Jesus. The Jesus that you have. Maybe there's somebody that is tormented and on the other side of your victory and your deliverance, on the other side of you getting through and hearing the voice of God, are you fighting to hear the voice of God, fighting to keep your marriage healthy, fighting to love your kids well, fighting to keep your finances healthy, fighting to do your job well and be faithful there. Maybe on the other side of that, your kids are going to be different because you fought for it. Maybe on the other side of that, there's a deliverance that your kids don't have to go through. They don't have to go through the addiction you went through because you fought that demon and you won. You heard the voice of God and you got to the other side. They don't have to face what you faced. Maybe on the other side of your marriage struggles, there is a family that knows what it looks like to fight for healthy things. Maybe on the other side of your financial struggles is a generation that's set free from debt and they can live different than you were ever raised. Maybe on the other side, you are setting free people that you haven't even met yet. And for this man, crying in the tombs and cutting him. So I don't, I don't know what that looks like. I, I mean, like I would, maybe we'll get to sit down with this man in heaven and find out what he was internally going through. Like, what are you going through that you're cutting yourself? What sort of torment is taking place that he needs Jesus for his deliverance? What sort of torment is it that he's crying out day and night that the only solace he can find is in the mountains and in the tombs? That the only place that he can be is away from people, hasn't had a hug in years. Hasn't had someone speak life to him in years. Everybody's afraid of him. Everybody shuns him. What does it look like to spend your life in tombs, cutting yourself, crying yourself to sleep? What does it look like to be that man? How difficult was it? But wasn't it worth it that someone was able to take Jesus and put him tired into the vessel and let him sleep to get him to the other side so that somebody on the other side could be delivered? And Jesus as tired as he was, in in his position, there were limitations to his fleshly body. He needed sleep and he was able to sleep and he was able to start heading to the other side because of the faithfulness of the disciples to obey his voice. And maybe your other side is you being the vessel that somebody needed to get Jesus to them that he saw them afar off and he ran and worshiped. He recognized my freedom is right there. My freedom is is right in front of me. Like all of these demons can't keep me from the son of God who's there to set me free. He ran up to him and worshiped him because he recognized all the torment, all the pain, all the struggles. It can be set free in this moment. And it was because a group of 12 men in the middle of the difficulty were waking Jesus up to make sure they made it to the other side to get where they were called to be, not even knowing what's on the other side. So there's no telling what's on the other side of your victory, of your storm, of you waking Jesus up. There's something on the other side and there's somebody that you're called to be there for. And I don't know what it looks like for them. I don't know what his story is if the disciples aren't faithful. I don't know if he stays that way the rest of his life and never gets delivered, but I wouldn't want to find out. 
I wouldn't want to find out who I messed up on, who I had blood on my hands for in heaven because I wasn't willing to fight the good fight of faith because I wasn't willing to seek out God's voice and listen to him and wake him up in the middle of the storm. I want to know that I got to the other side and I was the vessel that Jesus used to reach somebody else. And so today, I challenge you, wake Jesus up. Knock, knock on the door, draw close, do whatever it is you have to do because on the other side, your victory, it's going to be worth it. Let's pray. God, I thank you for a group of people who are maybe wrestling and being challenged. And God, I pray that they would take the challenge to hear your voice, listen to your voice, draw close to you and knock and seek and keep persisting because they believe that their prayers are effective. They're effective because they're reaching a heavenly father who loves them and has more in store for them. If that's you and you take that challenge, you say, today I I want to knock. I want to knock before the storm. I want to knock in the middle of the storm. I want to keep pushing until I hear the voice of God because I want to get to the other side. And I'm being challenged to do that. Would you raise your hand so I can be praying for you this week? Yeah. Hands going up all over. God, I thank you for a group of people who are challenged and bold enough to take it. God, I pray that this week they would hear your voice and they would take the step. God, I pray that this week they would keep knocking until they hear the voice. And if they're in the middle of the storm, God, I pray that they would draw close to you despite the fear of the waves, despite the fear of their circumstance, they would draw close to you until they can hear what you have to say, until it feels like you woke up in their life and had all the answer to calm the storm and get them to the other side. With every head bowed, every eye closed, there's others of you in this moment that um, you needed somebody to be the vessel. And I don't know what that looks like for you today. Maybe it was Mother's Day you came because a mom drags your families here. You came for child dedications, but maybe you thought it was those things and God was trying to attach himself to the vessel to get to you. Maybe you're not here by chance. Maybe you're here because it's time to hear the voice of God for the first time. And it's time to choose to trust and to follow him. See, cause he doesn't, he, he doesn't stop. He's pursuing you and been pursuing you and been pursuing you. And he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to tell you, I've got more for you. i got more for you. He's been telling you, he sent his son to die for you so that you could know he loves you and has more for you. Maybe today is the day it's time to make that decision. You stop doing life on your own and you get in Jesus's boat. You stop being in your own boat, rowing your own way, going down whatever stream you want to and choose to follow God's way. Because today, not only are you finding out it's not just about you, that God wants to save you. God wants to see you in eternity, but he's also going to use you to affect those around you. You're gonna start being the vessel. So if that's you, every head's bowed, every eye closed, and you're ready to follow Jesus with your life here in just a second, with every head bowed, every eye closed, you're gonna raise your hand, you're gonna meet me eye to eye. And that commitment is that I'm ready to follow Jesus with my life. I'm ready to trust him that he forgave me my sins, and I'm gonna let him guide where my ship goes, where the direction of my life. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you raise a hand, meet me eye to eye right now? Yes, sir, I see you. Yes, ma'am, I see you as well. Welcome to the family of God. Come on. Others of you saying yes, today's the day you're ready to follow Jesus with your life. Every head's bowed, every eye closed. It's your turn. Raise that hand, meet me eye to eye. Yes, ma'am, welcome to the family of God. Come on. One moment left, if that's you. All right, for those hands that I saw, we are going to pray a prayer. And everybody's going to repeat after me because we believe in the family of God. Nobody should pray alone. And for those that you raised your hand, I want you to repeat that prayer from your heart. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know that I made mistakes. And I know that I'm a sinner. But today, I choose to follow you with my whole life. Come into my heart. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to reach others. In Jesus' name, everybody said. If you are making that decision for the first time, and we want to say we are so excited for you. We genuinely believe the decision to trust Jesus with your life is the greatest decision you could ever make. But we don't only want to celebrate you. We want you to understand you aren't alone. Like this church believes in you and everything that God's called you to. And we would love the opportunity to get to be a part of your journey, to be able to be there with you every single step of the way. And one of the best ways we can do that is a very simple step. There's a phone number on the screen and you can text, I have decided to that phone number. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna give us the ability to connect with you. 
to get to contact you, figure out what the best way to have dialogue is so that we can remind you that not only are we excited for the beginning steps of this beautiful journey God's called you to, but we're also here for any questions or any help we can provide every step of the way. And we wanna say thank you so much for being a part of Live at Five today. We love you like crazy. We're thankful that you keep showing up. And remember, whoever finds God finds life.